Hey, this is Pastor Jerry at Crestview Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us today for the online message. I appreciate the ones who join week after week. And if you're a, a new guest today, thank you for joining us. I believe this is a message today that, that is helpful to all of us as believers and helpful to all of us who, who are going through storms of life. So there's a lot of good things in Scripture today to learn in Mark chapter 4. So this Scripture here that I'm going to be reading is the Scripture right after all of the parables that are in Mark chapter 4. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's done teaching the parables. And he says, okay, disciples, it's time to get in the boat and go to the other side of the lake. Great story today. So you follow along with me. And uh, we're going to learn something together. So right here in Mark chapter 4, it starts in verse 35. Just join with me. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37, A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it nearly swamped. It was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. See, so here at the beginning of Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, you can read where that Jesus, uh, there was such a mob of people around this, sea, this lake, this Sea of Galilee, that Jesus, the only way he could get away was to get into a boat and to go out into the lake a little bit. Uh, there was like a, an amphitheater, a natural amphitheater around here, so he could get into water, and people could get around on that, on that bank, and they could hear t Jesus teaching. So after Jesus was done teaching these parables, it was time for him to go. So he told the disciples, hey, let's go. Get in the boat and let's go. So I can imagine that again, there were so many people around, so many people on the shore, that there's no way that Jesus could get on the land to go around the Sea of Galilee to get to that place. The only way to get over there was, was by a boat. And it said in Scripture that other boats followed him too. So here is Jesus in probably that same boat he was teaching the parables. You have other people in boats. He didn't say how many, but other boats. And they were on their way to the other side of the lake. So let's, let's do a little something here. Because for us to understand this story, we need to know some geographical things. We also need to know some meteorological things, some weather things. So let's go to the map here of, of the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> the, the thing that I want you to, to understand here about the Sea of Galilee is that it is not like a sea that we imagine a sea to be. It is not like a, a huge, huge thing where you cannot see the other side of the sea. The Sea of Galilee from north to south is at the very most 13 miles long. And from east to west, it is the longest point is 8 miles long. So it's not big. You can see all the way around the Sea of Galilee. Here's another thing that is, you see on the map. At the, you see Capernaum. It's on the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus asks them to get in the boat and to go to about, on the right side to about midway down. So I did some calculations. And that is just about 6 miles. Probably a little less than 6 miles uh, rowing and these are skilled people who uh, these some of them are fishermen they've been in a boat they know how to row a boat and I can imagine that this trip in good weather was probably less than a 45 minute trip 
from boat from one side, that six mile trip from one side to another. So you got all of that. But, but here's another thing about the Sea of Galilee is that actually the sea is 687 feet below sea level. It is way down there below sea level. But surrounding the Sea of Galilee are mountains. On the northeastern side is uh, Mount Hermon that is 9,200 feet above sea level. So he, just think about it. And now we get into the meteorological part of it. Because uh, there's mountains surrounding it, you've got cold air up there, and you've got that cold air whipping down, going down, down, down below sea level to this tropical, humid, warm air. You, you can understand that there is regularly some pretty bad storms going on there. And, and I just want to give you, I mean, I've experienced this firsthand because in 1997, I went to the Sea of Galilee and, and uh, I was there a couple of days and, and I got to experience in a small way what these disciples must have, have experienced here on this lake. Because one of the days we woke up and we were doing the sightseeing and touring thing, I remember the weather was just, it was bright and sunny, just a really nice day. And, and after we started walking around the town for a few minutes, boy, I tell you, here comes some clouds. And it's just all of a sudden, here comes some clouds. And then with a few minutes, within just a very few minutes, it, it was thundering and lightning, and then it was just pouring down rain. And just a few minutes later, it was hailing. So in my experience of being down there, I can understand what they were experiencing. But, but what, what I understand from reading the scripture here is this wasn't just a typical storm because, you know, the fishermen lived there and they experienced storms. This was something that was even unusual to them because they were afraid for their lives. They, were thought, they thought they were going to die. And with all of that going on, they were panicked, they were frightened, they were scared to death, they thought they were going to die. And what was Jesus doing? He was in the back of the boat, laying on a comfortable pillow, sleeping. Jesus was sleeping. And, and here we go to another part of it. That it is such a bad storm. And, and Jesus, they, they woke him up and said, Jesus, you got to do something. Isn't, isn't that something that even though they didn't know what Jesus could do, they knew that he could do something? So they woke up Jesus, they shook him, they woke him up and said, Jesus, there's a big mess here, we're going to all going to die. And it said, all Jesus did was Jesus rebuked the wind and said, quiet, be still. From what I understand, the, this Greek language, the Greek wording here, it is like an authority figure speaking to uh, a lesser authority, to someone under him, uh, like another human being. So it, the way I look at it, it would be like uh, a parent speaking to a child that was misbehaving, like in a restaurant or something. And, and you're, you're the authority as the parent, and you're telling the child, okay, I need you to be quiet, and I need you to stay quiet. So that is the language that is going on here when Jesus is speaking to the wind. It's like he's the authority, and he is speaking to something below him of lesser authority and say, you got to stop right now. And they had no choice. The wind had no choice but to be quiet. So the, as it says in scripture, that the wind stopped all of a sudden and the seas calmed. That just, that just obviously amazed them. But Jesus, he looked at them and he said this in verse 40. Why are you so afraid? Do, do you have no faith? There's also in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, this same story is in there. And in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew's 
rendition of this, looking at this story, is you, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? So, again, Jesus was talking to them about their lack of faith. I mean, Jesus told them to get in the boat and we're going to the other side. So obviously they didn't trust Jesus enough and his words enough to believe that they were going to make it to the other side because Jesus said it was going to happen. They didn't have the faith to believe that they were going to make it to the other side. They lacked faith. So what what caused their lack of faith? What, what caused that? Well, I believe the answer is, is really clear, and it's in the next verse, in verse 41. The question is answered right here, because after Jesus calmed the storm, and after Jesus looked at him and said, why, have you, why do you have such little faith? Why do you have no faith? The next thing that the disciples asked is, amongst each other is, who is this? Who, who is this Jesus? So see, Jesus had been revealing himself. He had been with the disciples a while. He had been uh, teaching. He had been teaching parables. He had been explaining the parables to the disciples. They had already seen some miraculous healings. But they haven't experienced all of Jesus yet. So they were missing some, some things. And because they were missing some things, and they haven't had the full fellowship with Jesus. They hadn't experienced Jesus enough that Jesus was revealing himself slowly but surely to them and to the world that they just didn't have the faith that was necessary to trust Jesus even though the storms were raging about. Do you get that? Do you understand the, the simple question of who is this? had not been fully answered to the disciples at this point in Jesus' ministry. So the question here to apply it to us is, when you are asked this question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? What is your response to that? And, and let me let me say something here, and, and just to be really blunt with you, because if the storms of life cause chaos and doubt in your life, then you still have work to do on answering this, who is this question. Do you get it? So if you're going through storms of life, and, and all it does is just cause chaos and confusion and doubt and, and worry and frighten, then you've still got, still got work to do on answering this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus question? And see, there, there are stories in the Bible that helps us to see this, people who have answered this, who is Jesus question correctly. A couple of stories that, that just came to my mind is, is one is in Acts chapter 12. This is where King Herod, this uh, Jesus movement is moving forward. But King Herod is don't, don't want to have anything to do with this. He wants to stop this new Jesus movement, this young church. He wants to stop it. So he arrests one of the disciples, James, and has him killed, has him martyred. And right after that, he finds out the people are pretty excited about it. And he says, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go get the head of the snake. I'm going to go get Peter. He is the top disciple. And you know what? I'm going to take care of him. And after that, you know the Jesus movement is just going to cease to exist. So King Herod has Peter arrested. And I mean, it doesn't say this in scripture, but it definitely makes sense, right? that Peter is probably the next one on the list to be killed. And here he is in prison overnight, and it's not like a prison we can imagine today. It is, it is a terrible situation Peter is in. And, and I can imagine, here's Peter knowing that he's going to be arrested. 
that he's arrested, that he's going to be killed in the morning, and and I can and, and in most cases people would be panicked, right? They would be they they wouldn't sleep. But we read here in Acts chapter twelve, Peter is sleeping. This is, this is the same Peter that we're reading about here in Mark chapter 4 that's in the boat, that's scared for his life, that's frightened, that's asking his question, who is Jesus? You know, in Acts chapter 12, after he has matured, after he has had fellowship with Jesus, after he has experienced Jesus, after he has mature, matured, as he has been moving, moving, moving more toward Christ's likeness, you see now Peter is sleeping during as worse a storm, as bad a storm as could ever be experienced in someone's life. He has this complete faith in Jesus, in God, that even during this time, he's sleeping. That's just amazing, isn't it? To see that maturity, to see that faith in Peter. Here's another story. You, go, you can go to Acts chapter 16 This is uh, Paul and Silas. Uh, They've caused some commotion. In the name of Christ, they've caused some commotion in a town. And the townspeople are are just in uproar. And there's a big mob that comes and and gets a hold of Paul and Silas. And and what they do is it says they strip them and they beat them with rods. And then after that, the magistrates get a hold of Paul and Silas. And it says that they severely flogged them. So flogging, what that is, it is a it is a leather stuck, it is hooked to a, a stick. And, and on that leather, there's pieces of, of bone and pieces of lead. So when they rear back and they whip them and they whip them, that, that bone and that lead just goes into their flesh and just rips out their flesh. So he, can, consider what's going on with Paul and Silas right now, that they are beaten with rods, that they are disfigured, that they are bleeding, that they have big gashes of skin missing, and they're in prison in the middle of the night. And what does Scripture say that they're doing? They are praying, and singing hymns. See, for Paul and Silas, this question of who is this, they've got the answer. They have been around Jesus. They have experienced Jesus. They have had fellowship with Jesus. They have had obedience to Jesus in a consistent relationship to the point of when this happens, when the storms of life happen in their life, that their response is calmness, is is peace, is is faith. Do you, do you see that? Do you see that connection there? It's it's just uh, amazing what this faith in Christ can do. So in both of these cases here, just just to summarize it is. It's this simple. I'm going to put it here on the screen so you can just see here. I want you to absorb this as as it's being read. They knew, Peter and Paul and Silas knew from obedience and experience and fellowship with Jesus that Jesus is truly God in the flesh. He is God with them and that he will never leave or forsake them. That Jesus was the Lord of their lives and even more than that, Jesus was Lord over everything. They had the true faith. And see, because they had that true faith, when these storms of life come, and I'm telling you guys, because we're living in this sinful world, because we're living in this fallen world, the storms of life are going to come. There's no doubt about it. It's going to happen. And here's the question here. Do, do you have that kind of faith that when the storms of life come, that you're able to handle them in, in the appropriate way? See, faith that we see even during the storms of life. And, 
again, because of this sin-stained, sin-soaked world, there's gonna be there's gonna be storms. There's gonna be rough times. If you haven't experienced them, I'm telling you, brother and sister, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But it's going to happen. And I bet you most of you are watching, maybe all of you is watching, are going, yep, I've been through some storms. I've been through some tough times. But see, Jesus is with us here in these times, and he's helping us. And and see, this, this faith that helps us through this, listen, it doesn't come from a, a casual, uh, an intermittent, uh, uh, I'll spend time with Jesus, I'll fellowship with Jesus when I feel like it kind of time. If this comes, this faith comes from consistent. It comes from diligence. It comes from discipline. It comes from just being consistent day in and day out, this building this relationship, moving toward Christ's likeness. Again, I mean, I'm thinking about the Olympics here. Uh, the Olympics are going on during this time, and, and these people who are competing at this high level, they didn't just show up to the Olympics and say, you know what, I want to be a swimmer. They, they've worked for years and years and years and worked hard on their craft to to get to the point when it came to this time, this time of crisis, as we say, that they were prepared, they were ready, they were successful, they were able to be, they're the best in the world. It's the same way with us. Listen, this faith that we need to have during these times of storm doesn't happen when the storms come. You hear me? It, it is something that you develop years and decades before you're consistently growing and learning and building. It's discipline, right? Just like these Olympic people. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes diligence to get to that point. Do you, do you understand that? It takes experiences with Christ. It takes sp time spent with Christ to get to this point. It takes hard times, guys, to get to this point of where we have this strong relationship where we have this faith so that we won't be frightened in times of trouble. Just like we see with Peter and Paul and Silas. So, there's, there's one more thing that I want to talk about this message this morning that, that's so important. I mean, there's a lot of ways I could go with this story, but I don't want to go into a bunch of different areas. But one more important point about this here, about this storm that we read about in, in the story today in Mark chapter 4. It's through the storms of life where we truly experience God's greatness and God's presence and God's power. Do you get that? It's only by these disciples in this story being in the middle of the lake where this terrible storm comes is where they really experience the goodness, the majesty, the power, the authority of Jesus was in the middle of the storm. It's the same with us, right? We go through life and go through life and we experience Jesus in day in and day out. But I'm telling you, I've seen it in my life and, and I don't know, you Christian, you may have seen it in your life. The times where we see the greatness of God, the authority of God, is a lot of times when the storms are at the worst. And understand this about Peter and Paul and Silas. This is another thing that I just thought about. Is you know what they didn't they didn't know the outcome. These guys didn't know the outcome. They didn't know that Jesus was going to rescue them. You understand that? They just were so had such a relationship, such faith in Christ that it didn't matter what happened. That either way they were going to win because they had a relationship with Jesus. They knew who He was. They knew His authority. They, they trusted Him with everything. It, isn't that important to understand? It, it, are you at that point there in your life where, where, where you... Will you understand Jesus can handle any situation in your life where any storm that's going on, 
is the question is 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 Jesus the Lord of your life where you trust him to the point of no matter what is going on what kind of storm that you trust him that you you have that great faith that no matter what the outcome is Lord I trust you I know you've got me in this place and I know what whatever the outcome I'm still going to worship you. I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to have joy. Man, this is so so important for us. Again, it it doesn't start when the crisis comes. You hear me? And we don't also we don't also need to manufacture crisis, right? We don't need to it be a self-inflicted crisis. We we don't need to say, "Well, you know what? I'm just going to go rob a bank and just see what happens." And then I'll deal with Christ. That's that's dumb, right? We we have enough going on where we don't have to do it on our own. But but I mean, because of this sin-filled world, we're going to have crisis. And guys, the way that we handle a crisis doesn't happen when the crisis happens. It happens long before as we develop that relationship with Christ. We trust Him. We are obedient to Him. We have that faith that no matter what happens... That he's taking care of us. He is the Lord of our lives. Guys, this is so important. I've seen way too many people, way too many Christians, when crisis happen, when storms happen, where because they haven't developed that relationship with him, when a crisis happens, they fall apart. They walk away. Guys, don't be like that. Spend time with him. Be in fellowship with Him. Understand He is the Lord of your life and He is the Lord of everything. And rest in that. Rest in that. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for our time today. I thank You, Lord, that in in life that we're in a boat sometimes where the seas are tossing and turning and it just seems like it is just pure chaos. And Lord, we don't know how we're going to get out of it. But Lord, help us to get to that maturity, that obedience, that fellowship with you, that Lord, when these times come, that we're able to trust you and and keep moving on, Lord, and and to have that faith, Lord, that you're going to help us through it. No matter what the circumstances, Lord, help us to be like that. Help us to be, Lord, example to others, that when others are going through it, that they can see through our lives, Lord, that, that we trust you. That you are the Lord of our life, no matter what. Lord, help the ones today that are maybe going through just terrible storms in their life. Just, just help them to overcome these circumstances that's going on. Bless them. Lord, we praise you and we love you. We thank you, Lord, for helping us in the storms. We thank you, Lord, that during the storms, that's when we grow and we understand more of you. Lord, help us to learn and grow and, and be more like you. Lord, I love these people today. I I love teaching your word. Lord, help us all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.